Good morning, this is our time for the Lord's Supper. I'd like to uh, start with a, um, a uh, passage from Luke chapter 19. And I, I was led here by a comment that I heard uh, someone make recently talking about the situation in the world and in, uh, in our country with all of the rioting and uh, cities on fire and our people. Um, and the comment was, well, I'm glad God is returning soon. And uh, that's, it almost seemed like a, oh well, not much I can do about it looking for the uh, return of Christ, kind of a perspective. And um, although it is true that the Lord is returning soon, and we are to be looking forward to his return, which is, I think all those who love the Lord are, are doing so and do so. The scripture talks about, refers to all those who love his appearing. Um, while that's true, we shouldn't have a, a neutral perspective that simply throws up our hands and says, oh well, we'll just sit and wait. But um, I believe God wants us to be working in, in spite of and regardless of the, the current situation, whatever the situation is, as his people, we are to be working for his kingdom. And um, so this passage actually was interesting because I didn't, seeing it, reading it from this perspective, I didn't, uh, I didn't see it until I studied it. But it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 11, and as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. I never seen that line before, because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So they were, uh, they were looking for his return then too. <laughs> and, um, and then Jesus proceeds with this parable, which is a really interesting perspective on Jesus' response to that, uh, that anticipation of his return. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds. And he said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him, saying, We will not have this man reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded his, these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a little, in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man, Thou takest up that thou layest not down, and thou reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money unto the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto him that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. 
And they said unto him, Lord, he hath ten pounds. For I say unto you, that every one which hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me. So this is an interesting story that Jesus gives. It's slightly different than the parable um, in Matthew, where the th there's three servants. One's given five, one's given three, and one's given one. These 10 servants, appears to, uh, they, he gave 10 pounds, and it appears they each got a, a pound. Um, so they all were equally given the same amount of entrust by their master. And um, so what did they do with that? And I, I was, when I was meditating on this, you know, it's, it's possible to, to equate the pound to really anything. It could be the talents you're given or your life or your, your salvation, uh, your spiritual heritage. But I think more basically we could look at it as or, or one of the aspects we could look at is God has given us the same amount of time in a day. And that's, I've often heard it uh, referred that time is, is one of your most valuable things that you have because you can only, you only have so much of it and once it's gone, it's gone. And what did these people do with, what did these servants do with what God had given them, what their master had given them? And what will we do with what God has given us? Just as the master went away with a promised return, so Christ has done the same. <coughs> Just as the master gave money to his servants for them to steward, so God has given each of us his children things that he wants us to use for his kingdom. The good servants did not allow the perceived impending return of their master to prevent them from investing their money and using it for his advancement. But instead, they were diligent with what they had been given. The 10 servants were each given an equal amount of money to steward, yet they had unequal outcomes in the, with their investments. Some were apparently more gifted or diligent than others with their ability to yield a return. The ones who had less return were not faulted for their lower return. It was the servant who did nothing with his money who was faulted. So how does this apply to us? What are the talents or pounds that God has given us? Spiritual, physical, mental, financial, our time. Yes, all of the above. It represents everything and anything that you have been given. And I think um, more importantly, we shouldn't view life as a type of cruise ship Christianity. We shouldn't just kick back and relax and have a good time with what Christ has given us. We should be redeeming the time because the days are evil. There's actually two, uh, two verses in the New Testament that refer to this idea. Ephesians 5.16 and Colossians 4.5. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Colossians says, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. We must remember that God has placed us here on the earth for a reason. The reason is to glorify him and be his hands and feet in the world. We're not to be neutral and just passive and, and not taking a stand for truth when it needs to be stood for. 
This, pers this perspective should permeate everything we do on this earth. It should be the central driving focus and purpose for everything that we do. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And so talking about servants, it's interesting this story. Um, these servants start out being given and in trust, and they end up being made rulers over uh, cities. They're actually given cities to rule over, which is a remarkable transformation of their position from being a servant to being a ruler because of their faithfulness. And I think uh, it's important that we look at Christ because he was the perfect high priest, the perfect servant. He was faithful in all his house. So Hebrews chapter 3 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was, was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, insomuch as he who builded the house hath more honor than the house. For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony to the, of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of hope firm unto the end. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore was I grieved with that generation, and said, they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, that they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast unto the end. I'd like to uh, ask for, I guess, two men to help distribute the elements.